thank you so much. Yeah, it's such a delight to be here. It's always a pleasure. I had such a nice time the last time that I got to come and talk to your book club. So when you said you want to come back, I was like, yes, I do immediately. <laughs> hoorah, hoorah for us. And I wanted to also say that because, you know, I love the evocative reading. And yes. I wanted to preface your reading by saying, first of all, thank you for agreeing to read. And uh, we're really looking forward to this event. So many of us are just so excited. And we hope that it'll be an opportunity to explore this subject and your craft. And uh, why not kick it off, Emma, with uh -huh. something that you think might be uh, representative I think Wait. it's representative. So um, I have very quickly chosen a section from very early on in the book, which is from um, one of the chapters of the sort of semi-mythological women um, of Roman history, um, specifically the first queen of Rome, which is Tanaquil. Um, if you have children anywhere near you, um, possibly cover their ears for the next five to seven minutes. Um, but this um, is a story that comes from um, various uh, sources in Roman history about um, Tanaquil and her husband Tarquinius and why they ended up adopting a child that was not their own to become a king. Um, after this story happens a few years after they had um, ascended to the throne after coming to Rome from an, an Etruscan city um, and working their way up and then tricking their way to become the king and queen of Rome. Um, hmm. Despite the dodgy circumstances of their ascension, Tarquinius and Tanaquil ruled happily for several years. Tarquinius did what Romans did best and spent most of his time waging wars against his neighbours, including a town called Corniculum. In the sacking of this town, the Romans enslaved many people and took them back to Rome, including a woman named Acrosia, who may or may not have been the wife of the king of Corniculum and may or may not have been pregnant. In Livy's telling, Acrosia was already pregnant when she was captured, recognised as a royal woman and taken to live alongside Tanaquil as a companion in recognition, recognition of her royal status. In this version, Acrisia gave birth to her son, Servius Tullius, as a free woman, but nevertheless a royal hostage in the Roman palace. There is, however, another much more fun version told by every other source, from Dio to Dionysus to Pliny the Elder to Ovid. In that version, Acrisia was a non-royal and very not pregnant woman, enslaved by Tarquinius and given to Tanaquil as an ancilia, an enslaved handmaid. One day, after years of service, Acrisia was doing something with the semi-sacred fire in the royal house in the presence of Tanaquil, whereupon, to everyone's great surprise, a giant willy grew up out of the ashes. The Roman authors all become hilariously coy when describing this, even though they all have dicks decorating half their houses. Ovid blushingly refers to it as an obscene masculine form, which is very funny for a man who once wrote a poem about how girls get porn star loud in bed while Pliny opts for a male genital organ, lest anyone read the word penis in his book and faint. This floating ash willy proceeded to impregnate poor Acrosia, because Tanaquil, who was able to recognise that this was a come on from the gods, offered, ordered her to sit down on the fire and fuck it, and Acrisia obeyed. In doing so, Tanaquil acted as the interpreter of the gods, understanding that they wanted her to give Romans a hero a scion superior to the race of mortals, and that Acrisia was the chosen vessel, like the Virgin Mary, but a bit ruder. Quite whose dick it was floating in the ashes is up for debate. Ovid is pretty clear that it belonged to Vulcan, the Roman version of Hephaestus, not the pointy-eared dudes, while Pliny thought that family's La, a kind of home-based guardian deity, was the father. On the other hand, one 19th century English translator of Pliny invented a cute theory that Tarquinius had impregnated Acrisia and then lied about it to escape the wrath of the Queen Tanaquil. Here we see modern-ish commentators converting Tanaquil from the wise mediator between the divine and mortal spheres into the cut queen hag who scared her cheating husband who also hates her. And that is misogyny at work for you. Anyway... All this gods and fire penis stuff was developed to explain why Tanaquil and Tarquinius had such a special fondness for Acrisia's son, Servius Tullius, despite having two sons of their own. The gods ordered that Servius be the favourite. 
God, Servius wasn't an enslaved child forever tainted by his enslavement, as Livy thought, but was in fact sent from heaven to rule the Romans. It was because she understood this that Tanaquil took Servius, who is more often called Tullius in the sources, but we already have a lot of names beginning with T in this chapter, and there are more coming, so I am trying to make this easier for everyone under her wing, educated him as she would her own son and trained him to be a, lady, a leading Roman man. Over time, Servius impressed Tarquinius and Tanaquil, who remained convinced that he had been chosen by the gods, so they married him to their daughter, making Servius their son-in-law. Their daughter's name was, naturally, Tarquinia. I warned you. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Thank you. That was a good choice. <laughs> so good. So good. Love that one so much. And Folks, as you know, those of you who've read the book, there's more where that came from. And it's just uh, one of the best passages to capture not only how, how your voice is developed in your writing and in this book, but also the tone you strike, how you communicate with the readers. You're in conversation with yourself, too, and, and with the text and these these writers across time it's quite an accomplishment and i i don't know how you did it but maybe you'll <laughs> maybe you reveal yourself to this afternoon or tonight yeah let me start off by asking you a little bit about how you began the book i always am curious about the decisions that people make regarding the quotes when they use quotes yeah. And you quote from Jane Austen and Northanger Abbey, Virginia Woolf and Amy Richland, who also seems to be very important in other ways for you in this book. So let me ask you a little bit about these choices for quotes. Uh, you know, there's a triumvirate there. There's the big <laughs> there's the big three, maybe. Yeah. So what yeah. does it mean to you? So the um the Amy Richland one is probably the one that um so Amy Richland is a um I think she's a UCLA she's a UCLA professor um one of the very earliest female professors to really pioneer the study of women in the ancient worlds like the she really pushed it forward her and a few others um really kind of forced people to pay attention to the idea that women were worth studying and that women's issues were worth studying in both classics and history. Um, and Mary Beard is actually one of the other ones. Like she's also very important. Like her early work, um, academic work is super important in the creation of this field. Um, and um, so she has a book called Arguments with Silence. And one of her, her kind of mantras, I suppose, is that just because it looks like there is silence, that doesn't mean that you have to agree that it is actually um, a gap in the record. There are always ways to fill it and there are always ways to um, kind of see around the issue uh, where you think there is silence. You can, or where even when you have representations of women, you don't have real women, what you can take from those representations is still something about women's lives um, because women are still consumers of those representations. And, you know, um, John Berger says that men look at women and women look at men looking at women. <laughs> and that is the same for the ancient world as well, that even when you only have men's representations of women, you are still women saw those representations of themselves and had understandings of them. So you can still at least gather what they what was represented to them as womanhood. Um, the the Northanger Abbey one um, is the quote uh, from uh, from Jane Austen about how um, history is very boring because it's all war and politics and you'd think it would be more exciting seen as most of it must be made up, uh, <laughs> um, which I think captures my... Um, my feelings about the lie that a lot of Roman history and a lot of history kind of in general is talked about, which is that it is often talked about as though it is a litany of things. Um, and there's the quote, the other quote that I've never put in a book, but one day I will, is that um, there's a quote from the History Boys, the Alan Bennett play, where one of the characters just says, history is just one fucking thing after another. Uh, <laughs> and that's often how history is taught, just a list of dates or a list of treaties or a list of 
great men um and it's not very exciting if you're not interested in those things but there are other ways of telling history that don't have great men and don't have a litany of dates but are lives and cultures and experiences and the embodied experience of living in a world um and then the virginia wolf quote actually um is about again about that representation of women the the women are used to seeing themselves magnified uh, or used to seeing themselves as a magnifier for men um and this is something that is said about women in roman texts very often that they're almost never saying anything about the woman that is being talked about like livia or agrippina but it's actually being a representation of how uh, men feel about their men how they feel about their husbands their fathers that uh, and they exist purely to magnify traits of the men um and i think that 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 quote captures how women are used in a lot of art very often um and how you have to work through that when you are trying to find women in the past well i think that you really set yourself with a great challenge and shown how it how it can be done and i really see you as one of those pioneers as well and so when i went to your bibliography as you know yeah as, as history people have to do we don't we Straight don't start yeah yeah we're like <laughs> what's the sources here what's the bibliography uh -huh. and so i saw amy richland's um Arguments with Silence, Writing the History of Roman Women uh, from 2014. And I said, okay, well, I know there's a story there. <laughs> and there certainly is. And there's more to come with that, of course. And I wanted to also ask you about your dedication. Because you <laughs> mentioned two women there. Yeah. And the first one is Professor Mary Harlow. And the second is your mom. Yeah. So. Could you please talk about the contributions that these two women have made? Yeah, well, my mom is my mom. <laughs> and she, I mean, uh, you, the nobody really shapes you as a woman growing up as a girl more than seeing your mother and how your mother is and, um, and how your mother interacts with the world. Um, I can talk about her because I know this is that she's not on this event because she's currently on a plane, so... <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I can talk about her openly but, and you know and she I'm very aware of how you know my the way that I see the world comes through my, the way that my mom grew up my mom grew up in the 50s and the 60s you know she was just always talked very, a lot about being a woman during that time and the things that she experienced when sexual harassment was just something that happened and that you just dealt with and I remember her telling me about her first job where she was paid um, fifty percent of what her male colleagues were paid because she was a girl. She was sixteen year old girl, so the sixteen year old boys got twice what she paid, and that was just acceptable. Um, that was there was no that was long before the laws were introduced that changed that kind of thing. And you needed laws in order to enforce that, and you needed laws in order to stop men from putting their hand up your skirt in the back room with absolutely no consequences. And she was always very open about um how the if basically if not left to the the world if left to its own devices will vic try to victimize women very often um unless there are protections um and so she kind of made me a feminist from a very young age of like being very aware of the the concept of patriarchy and the con and how these things are constructed and and she was always very furious about it and she you know is not a woman who um you know, she would describe herself as a feminist, but she also she left school when she was very young in order to get married. Um, she dedicated most of her life to her children and she didn't kind of build a career until we were in our teenage years. Um, and so um, she found herself in those kind of things that um, she, you know, she could wasn't allowed to be married and have be at university. Oh, no, your cat. <laughs> Bobka is a big fan. Hi, and, Bobka. and so Bobka has put in an appearance and uh, <laughs> will now uh, be listening raptly and will Good. not continue to uh, try to drink my water. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, 
so you know so I, I dedicated it to my mom because um if i'm going to write about women then she's the person who who shapes my understanding of being a woman in the world and then professor mary harlow was my um she was my supervisor for all of my degrees so she oversaw my undergraduate my master's degree and my phd um and so all of my um approach to history and all of my approach to writing really was shaped by mary um who retired a couple of years ago um and she has always been i just remember a lot of her writing so what and why is this interesting and question your texts and um like really pushing the the question of of how do we work with these texts you can't just tell a story you have to also think about why we know this story and how we work with things um and so um she shaped me as a historian um and was a great like just an amazing role model for me um for a good 12 years of my life really um so <laughs> uh so yeah so those are the two the two women that shaped me is what I said and they're the the two women who've had the biggest influence on me and the person I have kind of become and how I see the world so they got this book out of it I hope it was worth it <laughs> oh I think it was I'm sure I'm sure that uh, it's a resounding kind of tribute within a tribute. I almost see it that way. There's some kind of reflexivity there, I think, because so much of, you know, I know my mother will never make it into a history book unless yeah. somebody, you know what I mean? My mom. There's maybe, somebody writes her there. Yeah, yeah. Somebody has to make a decision to write people in. And that d depends upon a lot of choices. And I, I saw it in your book that these are conscious choices to yeah. put it, it on the record that these people are were influential they reveal things not just about men or not just about what has traditionally been told so i just wanted to i was just wanted to hear you talk a little bit about them <laughs> Thank and i'm you so very glad much. you did i'm so glad <laughs> you did that well let's jump right in to this what a small topic the ro women tiny Roman Tiny. Empire, you know, wow, that you got that many pages up. Mm. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So I'm in the introduction. Everyone follow along in your hymnal if you if you want. And I am just looking here that you said on page two, this book then is a revisionist history of the Roman Empire with capital I important, capital T things <laughs> relegated to the background. So I wanted to hear if you would please talk for just a moment about the idea of revisionist history. Some people find that anathema. Some people <laughs> uh, heartily embrace it. So what's the revision and what kind of uh, revisionist historian are you? So I suppose it decided it was revisionist in the sense that if you were, I can like conceived of this as a history of the Roman Empire from foundation of Rome to the end of the West, the end of the Western Roman Empire. So that was what it always was in my head. Um, but if you're going to tell that story, most versions, like 99.9% .9 of those versions are going to be focusing on specific political and military incidents. And they are going to go, they, you know, they're going to do foundation, but they're going to do Romulus and Remus and the fighting. And then they're going to do um, maybe a couple of the kings um, and then, you know, the and then the new Numa and the religion or whatever. And then they're going to skip forward and then they're going to do all of these kind of big events that happen, like the when the Republic gets overthrown and blah, blah, blah. Um, and it's and then they're going to do lots of wars. And then all of a sudden you're going to be dotted around and there's going to be loads of time spent fighting Carthage and there's going to be Hannibal and there's going to be battles. Um, and it's going to all be about the army and about a hundred men arguing with each other in giant woolen blankets um about um like legal issues uh and it's in the background there will be the plebs um and in the background there might be occasionally a single woman who appears as a wife 
or as a kidnapped victim. Um, and that is going to be a story of Rome, which is going to make the Roman Empire look as though it is 100% military and 100% interested in politics and therefore is going to eradicate, like erase, completely ignore um, the experience of 99% of people who lived in the Roman Empire who were not senators, who were not in the army, um, you know, who were not... Um, engaged in fighting against Hannibal and never saw an elephant um, and who certainly never sat through a, an argument with Cicero about anything. Um, and then it'll kind of trail off in the middle and then you'll get some goths and they'll all look like evil barbarians wearing trousers who come over a hill um, and it'll, yeah. Yeah. Um, and um not trousers, and gonna, not trousers not trousers i can't tell you how much the romans were disgusted by trousers because <laughs> uh, <laughs> of them to be very unhealthy um but they so that's going to be you know the story so this is that story in that it shows how the roman empire expands and then kind of contracts again and changes really significantly with the introduction of christianity and the changing of the um, of the systems that result from that, but through the lives of people who were living. Um, and where those things, those battles and those big important debates are things that affect them, but are not, perhaps not the most important thing that ever happened in their life. Um, like, I really love the story of Turia, which is, the, her story is the story of the fall of the Republic. She lives through the... Uh, all of the civil wars, like she's introduced in during the civil war between Pompey and Caesar after Caesar has crossed the Rubicon. But the thing that is bothering her is not that Caesar has crossed the Rubicon, it's that her parents have been murdered. Um, and that is the problem for her. And then her her fiancé is, is trapped abroad. And then they have all of these battles and she's concerned about her, her husband's well-being. And then... The thing that really devastates them, like the real stress point in their lives is that they can't have children. Like if you ever, if you ask her or ask him, like what's the worst thing that ever happened to you? They're going to say, we couldn't have children and we really wanted them. Um, and they were present at all of these battles and they were, you know, had all of these political experiences talking to Octavian and da, da, da. But the thing that he writes about the most length is the fact that they couldn't have children and she offered to divorce him so that he could have children with someone else and he loved her so much he said he could never divorce her um and so that's what it's like to live through a civil war <laughs> um and that's what it's like to live to, to live through three civil wars um and so it, the story that sh that suggests that roman history is all just men shouting men holding swords um, is one part of Roman history. And this is another part of Roman history, which is that women, people were alive, were living, were caring about their kids, about their husbands, about their um, the safety of their land, about how they're going to protect their people, about whether they can be the empress, maybe. Um, and, um, and, you know, um, how their business is going and can they use this earthquake as an opportunity to expand their business? Um, and that is what, you know, most people's life was like. And that is to me as interesting as telling the story of the plebeian revolt or Hannibal coming across the Alps or the a big battle of Actium. Yeah, I agree. I think that... <laughs> the what your book does, and I just want to encourage the audience, if you have a, a question, you can post that at any time in the YouTube chat or send it via email. Because as you know, dear readers, and I just ripped a, a phrase right out of Emma's own book, dear readers, <laughs> uh, which is one of the hallmarks of an Emma Southern book is that you're going to be addressed. So just yeah. get get ready, right? The fourth wall comes down. She's going to talk to you. We're going to have that, a conversation and whether right. you like it or not. <laughs> right. Whether you like it or not, she's talking to you and, and she's on to you because she knows you're snickering about things. <laughs> like how the Vestal Virgins have to monitor the sacred objects in a room called the, please correct me if I'm wrong, the penis. The penis, yeah, but yeah. it looks like penis. Um, 
and yeah, but not bump. <laughs> That, see, and she knows that you're snickering about that and says, stop it more than I'm once. Snickering. It's yeah, mostly because, to me. Well, yeah. it's funny. <laughs> well, and you know, that's funny. So I just want to say to everyone, I won't cover every woman in every chapter because that would just be terribly unfair to Emma to have to just go chapter by chapter. And we, we want to, just like Emma had to select women i'm going to select some that and one of them was tulia somebody i wanted to speak to you about uh, because that was in the i believe i'm right no turia sorry turia it, that's the one we, we just mentioned in the republic yeah. right that dealt with um infertility that's in the republic section and of course uh on page 131 if you're still following along in your hymnals dear readers was the squirting cucumber necklace you know that is <laughs> always a great um emblem for helping out with any infertility issues you're having or as a conversation starter just as a conversation starter like at no point is anybody are you going to wear a squirting cucumber and somebody not mention it they're going to ask what that is hey, uh. <laughs> hey, are you on a special diet is that what is yeah. that you know is everything is that... all right yeah 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 Yeah. so there's there's one part of it from plenty the elder Mm -hmm. right god bless him (laughs) well and i will have a follow-up on that but one of the things that i love about this chapter on turia it are the two slabs of italian marble that were the tribute to her that got completely destroyed and then recovered partially So uh, I'd like to talk to you or hear you speak just a little bit about that, this recovery of that story and how unique, like, yes, Stanley Kubrick. Yes. Yeah, they are like monoliths. Yeah. They are like (laughs) the monoliths. Or Barbie. You could include it in Barbie if you you wanted to. But that was probably before you were writing. So yeah, um, so right. I'd finished it by then. But um, so I had to do Stanley Kubrick. But yeah, so they are like reconstructed as far as we can tell. Um, they are about eight foot eight high each. They're huge. They're very expensive. They're the longest um private inscription ever recovered. Um, not all of it has been recovered because at some point, you know, after, um when basically Italy got poorer um, they started smashing up the marble that they found um, and reusing it in places that were more important. Um, And then it uh, it started in the 18th century, kind of mid 18th century through to the end of the 19th century. There were a lot of European, um, like incredibly impressive uh, missions really to find as many, um, Latin inscriptions as could possibly be found and they're collated um, and also recordings of inscriptions that have now been lost because some of these that we have from Turias are um, they were in churches that had been destroyed or they the bit of marble had just vanished but somebody had done a copy of it in the 16th or 17th century which is very useful um, and um, basically they just tore through libraries and archives and archaeological sites as many as they could they went through the catacombs and they found they went through churches that they knew had um reused marble so part of the um of Turia's inscription was used in the wall of a church a the biggest slabs were used as um, covers in catacombs, in uh, Christian catacombs. Um, bits and bobs just kind of plastered into basement walls and things like that. Um, and it, they were collated and then um, it was a German project to to sift through and uh, and put them all together. It was Theodore Mommsen who eventually put together all of the, um, the pieces to... I think have been found since Momsen did it, uh, which was like 1860 something, uh, since he kind of reconstructed it fully. And then two more extra pieces were found. Um, But it's one of those um, kind of magnificent pan-European efforts where at some time somebody was willing to give um, scholars 
enormous amounts of money to go and sit in monasteries for <laughs> for years at a time um it's a the kind of the kind of thing that you now dream of as a historian that somebody might uh, just give you money to go and find things um but they did and it all ended up being the corpus inscriptionum latinarum um that is an amazing resource um and yeah and Turia's um Turia's inscription was pieced together from from people finding bits and bobs all over the show and you know possibly there are other bits that are still waiting to be found that are plastered into a a church roof or something like that or buried under something um or in a uh yeah um lo lots of christian stuff ended up in um because the christians wanted marble and that was a useful way to get it so <laughs> yeah i remember when i've been on the appian way and now i'm rethinking a lot of the things your book is is very helpful in rethinking those uh, visits, those tourist visits that many of us get to go on, or if we're just traveling around and walking down a part of a particular section of a really historic area of a city or a village, that really it's it's the like you're saying earlier, the the silences, the yeah. absences are are all around us. And that was a particularly poignant chapter, I think, yeah. about that. Oh. And a success story and that <laughs> part of it was recovered. It is. It's a shame that the only bit that is, like, the biggest chunk that's missing is the bit with her name on it. Um, so helped. we don't know that her name is Turia. So it's kind of tip. It, like, feels very uh, symbolic to me that we have, like, that we have almost everything we want to know about her except her name um and it, that that feels like a um like symbolic of a lot of women's history which is that you never get everything that you might want from women's history and you don't you very rarely especially for the ancient world get something like a cicero where you have like so many different facets of their character because they published everything and then it got saved you get fragments um and there's always a little bit missing um that you would quite like in order to re like imagine the whole person um but uh yeah so we're, we're missing a name one day maybe it'll show up well i'm thinking like for example if for some reason we never had any surviving records of who camilla parker bowles was <laughs> yeah except for your reference to tampon gate which <laughs> okay dear Dear she wasn't the queen audience. at the time. No, she wasn't, but <laughs> she is now, this yeah. Is priceless. This is priceless. And I believe it's on page uh in your hymnals again, page 156. I was cracking up because I know one of your um characteristic ways of writing and talking about history is to give us an analog, not to say that this was like the past is exactly like the present. It's not to say that. It seems to me, this is my read, please correct me if I'm wrong, but it's trying to evoke a kind of emotion or an yeah. analog sentiment to say, just you know, imagine hearing what, who was then Prince Charles, now the king, uh, talking about longing to be a box of tampons in her underwear and wishing he a were a memory for me. Yeah, yeah, it was for yeah. me too when you when you mentioned it in a footnote, and there's nothing like a great footnote. Yeah. Because you know, one of the things that you do also that I want to just do a little shout out to <laughs> is you make the footnotes worth reading because they can be they they can be rough out there and some of us who are just trained to all right, read <laughs> the footnote, wear that, you know. Now you can read the footnotes here, folks, and then you'll if you missed it. Then you'll get a little uh, reminder. And if you remembered, you're like, oh, yes. And oh, a lot yes. of people do not remember it. Um, and I had to look it up at, when I was writing the footnote because I thought, I, ca I can't be remembering that. Like, did that really happen? <laughs> and it, it did. Um, <laughs> it genuinely was. I mean, it's kind of wild that we had a period of British history where we were just recording the royals and their phone calls. But... <laughs> Um, 
uh, but and then publishing them in the newspapers but we were and that's what we got um and it's uh but it's a useful teaching moment like if you know what it's like to hear what the man who is now the king say that he wishes that he was a tampon then um yeah <laughs> right exactly so that that i just want to do a little shout out to and this was out of the chapter uh, on julia caesar daughter of augustus mm -hmm. right okay and so one of the parts i just loved i i was how you describe these great men these leaders like augustus augustus the micromanager obsessed with his image i think that's true you know he won. I such think, a micromanager i think that's true and how marriage alliances were promises between two men and really thinking about what these these decisions and not kind of imposing totally a a contemporary way of thinking about it but one of the other elements of that chapter that I enjoyed so much was this issue of trying to make us connect emotionally. So what do you see as the reason for that? Why, why do we need a contemporary or even maybe more well-known historical, not that Tampon Gate shouldn't be well-known <laughs> by everyone far and wide, but what do you think is the importance of adding that to or incorporating that into history? For me, I think that sometimes when I'm reading history or when people are reading history, it feels like we're describing something that's happening in an alien society. And because especially when you're describing the ancient world or any world that isn't you know, using English and are using foreign language terms, and you're saying things like he was the consul and she was the he was the princeps, and um, it's hard to then understand like emotionally what it is like to live with that. Um, and if you, I think that so much of of history is or should be, perhaps I like think that it should be kind of an empathetic experience as well as an intellectual experience in that. The, the best history to me is the history that makes me realize that these are real people who have like complex feelings and have um com have complex lives that are not completely alien to how we would understand it. And you could pick any of us up and pop us into that situation and we would be like, okay, like it's weird, but I get what this is like. The, there's there's a big gold throne, and he's wearing of his face is painted red. But I get that this is a celebration of military glory, and I know what a celebration of military glory kind of is. Um, and it you know if you were popped into a triumph, you would feel that. Um, and I think that if you understand you can understand that these are not aliens. These are not doing something that you don't understand at all. They are doing something with different words, but they're doing something that you have, um, that we all have some experience of. Like we've all had our politicians do something um, bizarre or horrific or shocking, or we've all had a terrible, like a sex scandal. Um, and we've all had to deal with, and we know what it's like when the guy who's supposed to be um, the you know most important person who's presenting himself as this representation of of moral goodness suddenly does something that disappoints everybody. Um, and you you know, and you love to gossip about it and like whisper about it and have conspiracy theories about it. And we have this thing going on right now with Kate Middleton, for example, like where is Kate? Hashtag. Um, and everyone's just having a good time with it, basically. <laughs> um, and I strongly suspect that they were probably having a very similar good time when Julia suddenly um was disappeared because she um was having sex with too many people that she wasn't and everybody was like oh my god the gossip uh, <laughs> um and you know it's not an alien world these aren't people who feel or experience the world differently to us um they they have different lenses but they have the same emotions they have the same responses they have the same um largely the same lives that we do and i think that makes history 
I it makes history more interesting, but also makes it clear why it is useful and important to study history and be like, okay, it was always people. They're not like magical superheroes who thought rationally about everything all the time. They're just a bunch of lads uh, <laughs> bumbling their way through and quite possibly occasionally staring into the mirror going, oh my God, adulting is really hard. Uh... <laughs> Well, well, you mentioned conspiracies, and that was one of the topics I wanted to get into. And please, uh, you're going to probably need to correct me here. The chapter on Hispalah Bacemia. Bacchiana, yeah. Bacchi, Bacchi, oh, so please say that again for the... <laughs> Bacchiana. Bacchiana, okay. And this was the uh, Bacchanalian Conspiracy. And she kind of blew the lid off that. And yes, uh, could you talk a little bit about that? And what? why did that end up in a decree, a senatus cons consultum? Yep. Saying we can't have conspiracies. All this other stuff? Well, shrug. Yep. But no conspiracies, please. It's such a weird story, the Bacchanalia, and um, people who study it are slowly going mad um, over what it means because we might we know about it from two sources. One is a story that Livy tells, um, which is quite long and involved and very, very self-contradictory. Um, but it starts with this young man who's kind of a well-to-do equestrian, like upper middle class, business class kind of guy. Um, and he has a girl friend and his girlfriend is a sex worker um a formerly enslaved sex worker who's now a freed woman who is maintaining this but they're in love um and uh one day he says to her oh i can't come round for the next 10 days um because my mom says i have to be initiated into the rites of bacchus and i'm not allowed to have sex for 10 days so i can't come round." and she absolutely freaks out um and like barricades him into a room and starts crying and screaming and very like you know toxic behavior but she has a real meltdown um and says like you can't do it like i will not let you be initiated into the rites of bacchus this is it's a terrible thing no one who loves you would do this to you um and um there's something going on if your mom wants you to do this um so he is like, mm, okay. Um, and he goes home and tells his mom and says, okay, mm, Hispala says I can't do this. Um, so he, she says there's something up with what's going on. Um, at which point the mom and his stepdad um, throw him out of the house because it turns out that they um, were trying to initiate him into the rights of backers because they had stolen all of his patrimony, all of his inheritance from his dead father. Um, they had spent it all and they were going to initiate him into the rights of Bacchus in order to either have him killed or destroy his reputation um, so that they could get away with having stolen all of his money. Um, at this point, Livy puts in this kind of history, potted history of the the rights of Bacchus, which he says they used to be just women that did it, but then they started initiating men and they have their rights at night, which is very bad, like very deeply suspicious behavior and is bad enough. But then he has all of these wild descriptions of like, um, it has kind of singing and dancing and drinking of wine. Yeah. And then it goes into like, people taking all their clothes off and men and women are having sex over here and men and men are having sex over here and people are walking into the river with the fire that doesn't go out and they're ripping people apart and they have this machine that tears young boys off into caves in a kind of theatrical representation of the gods ripping men away and it murders them and people are being raped left right and center and then also over in the corner people are doing conspiracies uh to falsify wills and commit perjury um which is just very very funny to me to imagine all of this happening over there and then over here there's somebody being like right so on thursday you're gonna sign the will <laughs> Right. You spell his name right because yeah. we don't want this to be a contested will. Exactly. Or like, okay, so you're going to say that you were over here and I'll say that you were. And then <laughs> um, while well, there's some like 
orgies happening over in the corner. Um, but that is kind of how Livy uh, describes it and how he says Hispola describes like what it's like and says that she was forcibly initiated. And then through a kind of series of events um, whereby um, Hispola's boyfriend tells his aunt who tells the consul's mother-in-law who tells the consul who is suddenly very surprised to learn that there are orgies and murder sprees happening in the center of rome five times a month um and there's a great moment where he's doing his speech where he says um obviously we all thought that they were normal rights that we could hear and <laughs> but it turns out that it's murders and things um and it just makes no sense any of it um, but he then, um, they, Livy gives him this big speech about like clamping down on wicked rights um, and then everything, um, then they send out the army um, and repress uh, this this kind of wicked cult that is happening all over Italy because they only really, uh, uh, this is 186 BCE, so they've only really got kind of Italy at this time. Um, and so they send out the army and kind of repress it everywhere. But then we also have this, the actual Senatus Consultum, like the actual decree that said that the Bacchanalia is illegal. And all it says is like five people can't gather at night um, and <laughs> men aren't allowed to go. And it's very clearly like there's no orgies or murders or anything involved in it. It's literally just a... Uh, you're not allowed to meet in groups in order to conspire to perjure things. Um, and so it's such a weird little kind of domestic drama, which then turns into a, a chaos story of, of, of orgies and sex crimes um, that actually it turns out that the only thing they're really interested in is the perjury and falsified wills. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah um, <laughs> and it is such a, like... And everybody who writes about it is just like, I don't I don't know why Livy would tell this story, <laughs> but I, I love that he did. And he kind of has to mention her because we know for a fact that Hispola existed because she's mentioned in the Sinatus Consultum, in the decree. Like she's given a reward, so she's given some money, um, and she's also given the right to marry whoever she wants without them losing their status. So she can marry a free man and they will stay free like they won't uh, lose their citizenship um uh which is a you know that's great so that means that she actually definitely was involved in in breaking this whole thing open but the way that Livy tells it is just so so poppery uh, <laughs> um and has all of these really weird little details like there's a bit where she describes people walking into water with their hair down and they've got torches and the torches don't go out and then she suddenly has this amazing knowledge of chemistry it's like they don't go out because they're covered in sulfur <laughs> like, thanks for the useful detail <laughs> well you know that's one of the things that i really love about this book is that you get a kick out of how unusual these sources are how unusual and quirky and uh just irreverent but also earnest and then so they're so earnest they're so earnest while they're telling you the strangest things yes, yes. <laughs> they'll be like yes some animals don't have blood for six months of the year and you're like i think they probably did Pliny, but i pre <laughs> thanks note to sell thank you moving on <laughs> yes yeah. well this is dear audience just a sample of what we could touch on and I know I've got some questions pending so if you haven't had a chance to post it yet please do but I have one already okay from Art and Art said uh, his question is you mentioned that there were a number of other women that you could have profiled are you planning a sequel with additional stories of women in Rome you know, I hadn't planned a sequel, um, but maybe one day I will do one because there are other women and other stories that d did not make it in. I would have to think of a good way to put them all together. Um, but there are people who who didn't make it in because either they were too close or too similar to a story that I did tell or I had too many stories that kind of clustered in one time um, time period. Um 
but uh, maybe one day I will do a sequel um, and it'll be, it'll, I'll have to come up with another good title though, Rome of One's Own 2. Uh... Right, there, there's a, a definitely going to require some some clever thinking to get another yeah. great title like that. But that, but if anyone can do it, I, I know you can do it, Emma. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the next question is, and this may be like choosing between favorite pets. And by the way, by the way, the reference to the lesser god Farina, the yep. the, uh, the god perhaps let's of just tiny speculate kittens. some yeah. tiny, cute little kittens. No, no way of one. knowing whether she was or wasn't. <laughs> but I like it. I like it. Yeah. So uh, the question is, who is your favorite woman to write about? Uh, to write, oh, there's two who are my equal favorites. I think one is Julia Felix, who is the woman who runs a complex in Pompeii, um, and runs this business. Um, and you can see so much in the archaeological record that kind of hints at her personality, even though we know nothing really about her. We know that she's called Julia Felix, the daughter of Spurius, and that she owned this complex. But we also know that at some point when there was an earthquake in 62, like uh, 15 years before the Vesuvius erupted, she had a road moved so that she could exp like merge two estates into one. So there's a kind of this hint that she is a woman who can get stuff done. Um, and we know that she decided to decorate her space with um, a really unusual portrait like mural of Pompeii on market day in the forum and all of the things that are going on of like the middle what middle classes do on market day um and we know that she did up her baths all fancy so that they were somewhere for kind of well-heeled people to go and have baths and like there's all these little hints at a, at a personality that come through her house and how she has decorated it and then the fact that she the kind of miracle of the fact that we only know her name, we only know that she owned it and what it was because at the exact point that Vesuvius erupted, she had put it up for rent and she had painted a for rent sign on the outside. And if we didn't have that, if she had waited six weeks or if she had already done it, then we wouldn't have it and we would not know that she existed at all. Um, I kind of loved that um she just uh has so much coming out of her 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 house her space um and my other is julia balbia um who is the um woman who travels with hadrian and sabina the empress sabina um and is traveling with them in egypt and then carved four poems on the side of the um a colossal statue of well, it's Amenhotep the fourth, but they called him Memnon because he sang. Um, and I love that she put so much effort into writing these poems to really show off how clever she was and how educated she was, and also put her name on every single one of them. But I mostly love that she, the first day that they went to see the statue, which sang for like a two hundred year period, it sang in the mornings. Um, and they say sang, but when they describe it, they describe it as a lyre harp snapping, which is a horrible noise. So I think they might have been <laughs> um, being polite when they said sang. But it was kind of a, like it was an amazing thing. So people were going to see it. And Sabina, the empress, went to see it and it didn't sing on that day for whatever reason. And so um, Julia wrote a poem in which she said, oh, um, the god uh, didn't sing for you today, but it's because he knows you are so beautiful that he wants to see you again. Um, and he has done, he's not sung so that you have to come back a second day so he can get another glimpse of you. Um, which I think is such a nice thing to say about your friend who at that time, her husband was wildly and openly mourning the death of his boyfriend <laughs> um, to an extent that the main thing that we still talk about when we talk about Hadrian is Antonus um, and how much he cried that his, about his dead boyfriend. And this happens like two weeks after Antonus dies. And so I like the fact that she was like, oh, it's okay, you're still pretty. I still I still love you and you're still pretty. <laughs> I, um, I love the story of being in Pompeii 
And that that was Julia Felix. Uh, I loved her because having been to Pompeii, and for those of you who have been, uh, you know, yes, that was an erect penis over the oh, door. Oh, yeah, everywhere. Everywhere. And I, I was there as a very naive, sheltered, young, private college uh, lady uh, to be uh, polished and prepared for not those kinds of things. And they but, took you to Pompeii and showed you all the penises. Well, nobody in no nobody in the group who was leading it pointed it out. It was really <laughs> side glances like, is that a penis? What is what are we what's the, going on here? They and didn't we, take you into the brothel then. Uh not on purpose. <laughs> but we had to, you know, we had to, you know, that's what that's what mischief's for, Emma, and I'll mm -hmm. leave it there. Uh, that's good you know what i'm saying yeah <laughs> that's that's when you do your own side investigation and so that was an eye-opener I, I learned some things but we're at the top of the hour and uh, to just uh, be uh, respectful of people's time i want to definitely give emma the opportunity to maybe say some final words and also perhaps tell us is there something next? Is there something you're <laughs> you're planning that you can? Uh, well, uh, my so the next one I officially have coming out is a, a children's book um, with a public historian called Greg Jenner, which is about Roman Britain. It's called Totally Chaotic History. Um, so that one will be out in October. Um, and yeah, so that one has been fun to do for right for children, and then. The next one for adults, next proper book, um, has um, gone out to editors today. So uh, we have to hope that somebody buys it. Um, so <laughs> um, if somebody buys it, then hopefully it will be about the Roman imperial court and the people around the emperor and who lives in the palace and what their lives are like. Wow. Well, those so, are that's great. Yeah. Fingers crossed somebody wants to publish it. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they I'm sure they will. There's no doubt you're you are on to something here, clearly. And we love, uh, you know, reading your work, but also learning about history and juxtaposing it with other times in history. So it's more multifaceted and rich and fills fills out the not just the spectrum of the elites or maybe sometimes the the most marginalized there's room for everyone and i wrote this down uh because you you had said it so i had to isn't it fun to be quoted it is it it's is a, fun i, I forget like, that i write things so it's great <laughs> well let's just memorialize this yeah. sentence okay no one is just one story yeah and yeah i stand by that one yeah. As you should, as you should, because we we are more than just one uh, snippet, one decree, one poem, one uh, sign on the wall. We're, yeah. we're a lot more than that. And I really appreciate you taking us to that time period in a broad sweep of Roman history and looking at women on their own terms and what it says about women at these times and also trying to recover voices and stories and histories every day in every way that's emma southern with <laughs> with and i'm about to hold it up here this great book cover yeah, and i'll hold up my one i remember one saying okay a room of one's own the it's forgotten women cover. it's a great cover it's a beautiful Beautiful cover. I love it. The Forgotten Women of the Roman Empire. Emma Southern, thank you for joining us from Belfast. And thank you, audience, for being here. We really appreciate you being here today. And have a good rest of your day or evening. Thank you. <laughs>